Mike, um, Nune Nunia Wachima Much, Nune Marikania, Dr. Stacy Oberly, Nune um, Bi Gap, Bino Nuch, Nune Mu Quach, the Gossip, Nut Binu Kwama Much, Nut Mamakarud, Binu Vat, um, Nut Binu Waka Nigit, Tu Ayakumi Vapunike. I'm Dr. Stacy Oberly, and I'm really happy to see you here. I wanted to start off with this slide. Um, you see, we have an old, old picture of a child, a youth child in a cradle board. And I like to say that my ancestors are um, geniuses. So there's the, the old, and then there's my um, youngest child who's 13 now and his cradle board that I made for him. So what I like to do is brag on my ancestors. Cradle boards were the first car seats, the first um, bouncer seat, seats because they would hang them on the trees and the wind would rock the babies and the first helmets because they protect the baby's heads. How do I know that? Because my youngest daughter was in her cradle board when her big sister and her enthusiasm to play with her knocked her over off the bed onto the floor and I was really freaked out, my baby! And I picked it up, picked the cradle board up and she was smiling and laughing. She was completely <laughs> fine. Nothing was hurt on her at all. So my ancestors were geniuses. I'd like to point out my outfit here. This is what we call a, a ute belt, but usually they were thicker. They were really thick. What do you think a thick belt reminds you of nowadays? What stores do you see people wearing big, thick belts? <laughs> like Costco, right? They wear those big belts to protect their backs. We are, my ancestors knew that. The women owned the teepees, the houses, the homes, because we're matri matriarchal. So the women always wore these thick belts to protect our backs. And you know, this is a traditional ute dress. It used to be made out of hides, but now we use cloth. And it's got this nice opening here, because when it gets hot, we can have ventilation. And if we need to feed our babies, we can just feed our babies. Aren't my ancestors geniuses? They are, they really are. I just wanted you to, to notice this stuff. I'll point out some other genius ideas they had as well. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about um, the Ute Nation, the Southern Ute Tribe, Ute Language, Revitalization, and um, hopefully if I hurry through, we'll have questions at the end. So I don't like to bore you too much. So I, have, I need you to answer these questions for me, I have a few questions, just to put it in perspective. How many tribal civilizations were there in the U.S. before colonization? Yell, yell out your answers. E. Give me the numbers. 1,500. 1,500, is that it? Only guess? 1,000, you were close. <laughs> yeah, second guess, okay, next. Oh, wait, I have another question in a bit. But I wanted to talk to you about the big picture of the Ute Nation. This was before reservations were formed, okay? Our, our tribe was, consisted of seven bands. I'm, I'm part Muwach and Kaputa bands, and we, we love our bands. And because we were hunters and gatherers, we stayed with our family bands and traveled the, our hunting grounds and harvested per season. We didn't stay all together in one place, and why do you think that was? Animals move. animals move. And what would we do to the firewood if we stayed there all the time? We, we would just decimate the ecology. So we didn't ever want to do that. We wanted to honor the earth, keep it healthy, so we moved in our family bands. So we spent most of the year with our family bands. And in the family bands, the elders were our leaders, especially, um, and the women were in control of the houses because we took care of the houses. We took the teepees down, packed them up, um, put them up real quick. Uh, the homes were the women. So in our society, if a woman liked a man, she would make a pair of moccasins for, for him because we were really good at making um, tanning hides that we got from harvesting and make moccasins for him. And if he chose to be her husband, he would wear those moccasins. And that was that. Then he would move into her house and they would live happily ever after. No, not really. <laughs> 
But when she got tired of him, she would just take those moccasins she made and put them outside the house. <laughs> and that was that. It was all up to her because it was her home. She was the head of the household. And that sort of mindset is still in our tribe today, matriarchal. And they were known for um, getting the horses early from stealing them from the Spanish, so really acquiring horses early. How many federally recognized tribes are there in the U.S. currently? Number? 574. 574? 574? Got it. <laughs> How many federally recognized? Don't answer right away. Let someone else answer. <laughs> How many federally recognized tribes are there today in Colorado? Four, good guess. Two. We have the Southern Ute and the Ute Mountain Ute, and we're both in the southwestern corner. So as I was saying, um, we traveled in our family bands hunting and gathering. When it was hot, where did we go? Up in the mountain valleys. When it was cold, where did we go? Down to the desert areas. We invented snowboard birding. <laughs> we knew about that a long time ago. That's just how you live, you know. And then once reservations were formed, our Ute Nation got broke up into three different reservations. The Utah Utes, the Ute Mountain Utes, and the Southern Ute. And I'm from the Southern Ute Reservation. And our reservation is 15 miles wide and 110 miles long in the southwest corner of Colorado. So what is a checkerboard reservation and how were they formed? Okay, you can answer. <laughs> Anyone know? Well, how did that happen? Yeah, so the, so the reservations were given to, the, to our tribe, our people, until they found out that there was gold and silver and great farming. And then, of course, the legislation changed so that we had the Dawes Act, which said each member, each head of household. What is the head of household in American way of life? A man. In Ute way? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Such an issue there. It's all backwards. I was going to say something else, but I'm in public, so. <laughs> so that happened. So they gave allotments to each male head of household, and the extra land they put up for sale. And so that's how we got into a res uh, checkerboard. So another question. What type, sorry, not too many types, what type of land ownerships are on the checkerboard reservation trust? That's land held by the federal government. Fee, that's private land. Tribal, tribal land that's owned by the tribe, not in trust. Allotment, that is individual land that is um, passed down from those head of households from a long time ago. Or all of the above? All of the above. And each type of land has a different type of jurisdiction. The trust land held by the federal government is under the jurisdiction of the federal government if, it is a, if it's a native person that is being charged. If it's a non-native, then it's a big mess. Whose jurisdiction is it? Depends on who the victim was, what they did. It just makes it really hard for us to govern in our own lands with this jurisdictional mismatch. It's, it's, it's rough. So this is what our reservation looks like. The dark brown is reservation land. The lighter brown is land that's private. And then the green is currently irrigated land. So what do you notice about the coloration? Yeah, so most of our reservation land is away from water. So it's very hard for it to get irrigated. But we're supposed to be farmers. 
how can we be farmers if we have no water to irrigate our land? Is that a fair system? No. And then the gray is the Forest Service. So that's our splotch of land right there, um, southwest Colorado. And then um, over off um, on that side is the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation. Okay, why did the U.S. make treaties with tribal nations and not other types of agreements? You were at war with the U.S.? Because we were at war with the U.S., so we needed peace treaties. Mm hmm. Any other? Well, was, That's good. There's a system designed by the colonizers. So it's a, a system that's um, oppressive. oppressive system? Yeah. Well, the reason why those, those are very important points is because tribes were considered sovereign nations. So a nation to a nation agreement is a treaty, it couldn't be any other sort of agreement. So as a sovereign nation, we have our own inherent sovereignty. It wasn't given to us by the U.S. government. We've always had it because we were indigenous to this land, or we are indigenous to this land. So that's why we had treaties. So how many treaties did the U.S. make with tribal nations? Yell it out, yell it out. Hmm? 400? Anyone else? 500? 900? 500. 500. How many treaties <laughs> did the U.S. break with tribal nations? Numbers? 500? 900? All of them. All of them. They made 500 treaties. They broke 400. They kept 100 in some way, sort of fashion. That's not a very good success rate. <laughs> Pertaining to treaties, what are trust responsibilities? A, the highest moral obligation that the U.S. must ensure the protection of tribal and individual Indian lands, assets, resources, treaty, and similar recognized rights. B, a legal obligation under which the United States has charged itself with moral obligation of the highest responsibility and trust towards Indian nations. C, a legally enforceable fiduciary obligation on the part of the U.S. to protect the treaty, tribal treaty rights, lands, assets, resources, as well as the duty to carry out man the mandates of federal law with respect to tribal nations. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. What is happening right now with the Supreme Court is going to throw all of this out the window because the Supreme Court or Arizona is arguing they don't have any treaty responsibility whatsoever to the Navajo tribe. So if you're really concerned about our sovereignty and our rights, let your legislator know that what's, what could be happening, that Arizona's claim that they have no, no trust responsibility to any tribe is, is out of, it's, it's wrong, it's super wrong, and we need to, to fight that, because it'll, it'll just devastate an already devastated population of people. Okay, so talking about the language, um, my language is from the super huge Utah Aztecan language that goes from like um, central, no, South America up to up this way, uh, up into Wyoming, um, the northern um, branch. Uh, we're part of the Numic branch, and Ute is from the southern Numic branch. Um, we're closely related to Chimueve, uh, southern Paiute, and Kuwaisu, also Comanche and um, Shoshone. So those are the languages we are closely related to. Um, I put this picture in here of my son. I was wrapping him up. So we swaddled the baby before we put the babies in the cradle board. And look at him. He's happy. <laughs> Being in the cradle board for my kids wasn't a torturous thing. It was a safe, comfortable place. And being in a cradle board teaches a lot about how we expect people to be as human beings. When he's in his cradle board, his body is still because he's swaddled. So we expect people to have control of their bodies and not just be flailing around. When his body is still, he can focus on observing and learning. Babies who, um, research shows that babies who've been in cradle boards 
um, they develop better eye tracking sooner than babies who aren't and they develop better head and neck control because they're upright more often than, than just laying down. Um, and so when your child is in the cradle board and you have to wash dishes or cook dinner, you just bring that cradle board and prop it somewhere. So your child is observing how it is to be a human being. They observe how we, react, uh, how we interact as a family. Um, and they're not like separated in the crib all by themselves alone. They're always surrounded by their family. They're learning, they're observing. And that's how we expect them to be as humans when they're out of the cradle board. Be a part of the family, be helpful, be involved, control your body, watch and observe. So there's so many things that get taught just from these things that our ancestors passed down to us. Just how to be a human being, how to act and how to interact in the world. Okay. This kind of leads into that. This is one of my favorite quotes. Language ties to identity, to aesthetics, to morality, and to epistemology. Through such linkages, they underpin not only linguistic form and use, but also the very notion of the person and the social group, as well as fundamental social institutions. So kind of like the cradle board, it teaches you how to be, how to be in this world. Our language has the same thing. I'll give you an example. My mom was a fluent speaker. She, pi uh, she passed away over a year ago. But when I was a freshman in college, I got a cassette player. I don't know if you guys know what those are. <laughs> and I went to her and I said, Mom, I need to learn you. Can I record you? And she said, yeah, but why are you recording me? I said, because I want to learn you. And she said, well, I'm not going to give you any more language until you learn what you took from me this time. So then she would test me. She held me accountable for my own learning. So there was one point I went to her and I said, Mom, I really want to know how you say I'm sorry in Ute. My little cassette recorder ready to go. She was thinking and she was thinking and she was thinking. And in my mind, I have the deficit, deficit view brainwashed into me. And I thought, oh, my poor Ute language doesn't know how to say I'm sorry. Why is she taking so long? My gosh, you know. And then she finally said, we don't have I'm sorry in Southern Ute. And I said, why not? You know, I was thinking deficit view. And she thought again. And then she said, because in our way of life, you're always supposed to carry yourself in a way that you never, ever, ever have to say I'm sorry. What did that do to my deficit view? English is deficit because it has I love you. That means you can act any old way you want and then get, get away with it. But in you, you can't. You have to be a good person all the time, everywhere. Because you can't get out of it by saying I'm sorry. How powerful is that? Not having so, I'm sorry in a language holds you so much more responsible for who you are as a person in your society in respects to how you care for the earth and the environment. It's just very, very profound. And to me, that's why language is just so key to identity and how we could be as a, as a people. A little um, talk about our language policy. Um, the first policy was prohibition. And um, I'm really glad that the doctor was reading about um, Chimney Rock, because my mom's mom, my grandma Daisy Gap, she grew up at the bottom of Chimney Rock. Her grandparents raised her down there. And they always told her, if you see a white person, you hide. Because the white person was usually the Indian agent coming to kidnap the kids to take them to boarding school. So she was really good for a while, but one day she got caught. They took her from Chimney Rock area and they shipped her down by train to um, Albuquerque Indian School. And she said when she got there, she was so sad and lonely. And all the little kids were so sad and lonely that they were dying of broken hearts. Because it was so different from where they were with their families. And she also said that when she got there, they were doing experiments on her eyes that in the um, infirmi in 
infirmary that all the little kids had um, bandages on their eyes because the doctors there were doing experiments on them. And I kind of didn't think that would be something that would happen. But when she was like 84, we took her to the eye doctor because she had cataracts. And you think cataracts is easy to remove, right? The doctor said, we can't do anything with her eyes because they're so scarred up from what happened when she was a child. So when, when we first sent our kids to um, Albuquerque and Fort Lewis boarding schools, we sent 43 between 1830. 1883 and 1892, we sent 43 of our kids away, or they were taken away. Out of that number, 16 died. And three of them were blinded. So then from 1902 to 1950, we had a federal boarding school on a reservation. The Allen Day School were for the kids who didn't have to stay in the dorms. And then we had a boarding school where the kids stayed in the dorms. Um, and that closed in 1983. That wasn't very long ago. And then once those schools closed, then um, our tribe, our students could go to the local public school. And then we start looking at revitalization. In our local public school from 75 to, to 81, we had this awesome program the trilingual, tricultural program at our Ignacio Elementary School. What that was, was they hired a Spanish teacher and a Ute language teacher, um, which were aides in the school, but they were elevated to teach us Ute and Spanish at the same time. And once that program started, our um, parent involvement increased at the parent-teacher conferences from 20% to 85%. Why do you think that is? Having people that you look like as real teachers is powerful, super powerful. The test scores increased at 70%. There was, of course, an increase of minority staff because they needed teachers. And the teacher's expectations of the students also rose. And that's super important. I see that in our own, um, our own private tribal school, is if a person comes who doesn't know of our culture and our, our, our our history, our community, they tend to have that deficit point of view on our kids. Like, oh, they can't do that. You know, they have such a bad home life. They possibly, like, it's impossible for them to learn all this stuff. And what does that do to our kids? It's terrible, terrible. So um, our tribal council noticed um, that a lot of our uh, tribal students who were in the public school were getting referred to special ed at a disproportionately higher rate. When they got in trouble, they were suspended or disciplined much more harshly than any other race. So they decided to try a model program from 93 to 2000. It was called the Blue Sky Montessori School. And they went, went to different schools all over the U.S. and found an approach that fit to the, the, our way of life, and that's the Montessori approach, because it looks at the whole child and not just academics teaches every aspect of social, emotional, science. It was, it's just a great approach. So after the pilot program, they loved it and saw success with the students. So they opened up uh, a private Montessori school. It's 100% funded by the tribe because once you start taking outside money, what happens to your control? It gets taken away, right? Because you, you have to make the grantors happy. So currently right now, we only have about 17 fluent youth speakers out of our 1,480 um, membership. They're over the age of 70, and most of them live alone. If you have a fluent speaker who lives alone, how are family members going to learn the language from them? It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. So, oh, Jesus, slides got crazy. So I wanted to show you a little bit about our uh, way our words are formed. Morphologically, it's called agglutinative, which means you take parts and just keep building. So the first um, part is bu'iv, um, it means eye. If you put pana bu'i, it means shiny eye or bright eye. What, why do you think our ancestors described glasses that way? The glare. 
the glare, yep. And then two, panapu inap. The dark bright eyed glasses, so those are the sunglasses. And if you want to say my sunglasses, then you do two, panapu i napun. The N at the end makes it my. So look how big our words can get real quick. Very descriptive, very, very interesting. These are our consonants. Um, it's not too crazy. <laughs> you guys laugh. <laughs> but sometimes um, our consonants change. So we have, for example, kan for house. But if we add nu in front of it, then it changes to a, a g, nugan. Kwanuch for eagle. If you add gray in front of it, c, c, it turns into a g, c kwanuch which is hawk. Kava is borrowed from Spanish. And if we want to say white horse, then it turns into a G, sakava, sakava. So those are some of the cool things that happens with our sounds. These are our ute vowels. They're so beautiful, it's so balanced between the front and back vowels. One nice central vowel. Sorry, I'm a linguist, so I like these things. <laughs> But one thing that's really interested, interesting about Numic languages is that our vowels are devoiced sometimes. So on the first line, we have the word quat, and the last vowel where those lines are shows that there's some slight formants where the vowel should be. And if we add nog onto the end of the word quat, which means in the car, then that U um, is fully voiced. You can see the whole formants there. Um, so this is a really important aspect of Ute language. It's difficult to teach learners because in English, we don't really have just our magic silent E. You know, that's all we have in English, but we have this in Ute all over the place. So um, they can be devoiced when they're between two consonants that are devoiced, or they can just be devoiced just because. <laughs> and the just because cases are awful. <laughs> So, for example, cow, kchupuk, kchupuk, pants, ksuna, 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 um, to grab, ch, ch, a, ch, a, ch, a, and then just navas, navas, navas. So there's all these interesting things, and this is why, for me, documenting you with high quality video is a must. Just using, using uh, audio recordings will completely miss what's going on with the speaker's mouth. So our sentences, we have rel relatively free word order. So in this one, we have uh, kura, uru, uwas, aipuga, senuav, u, uwe, Chikachiev. There be that was, or he um, said, Sinewav, which is our trickster, our woof, the, um, to his brother. So then Sinewav told his younger brother. Is that kind of scary? <laughs> <laughs> but it prefers having the verb last. So if you look at this one, it's the woman saw the boy. So we have mamach u, women the, apach uwe, the boy the, and then panike kya. So that's not as crazy as that other one. This kind of makes sense, right? No, you still scared? <laughs> so all you got to know is that the v, the verb, always comes last, most of the time. Subject, object, verb. Yeah. Uh, is there a difference between present tense and past tense? And yeah. Like, I, see, I see that as but the phrase is off. Yeah, yeah. So that kya at the end, oh. that makes it past tense. Oh, mm -hmm. Good observation. <laughs> Give her an A. No. <laughs> and then you can see from this how crazy it can get. I just wanted to scare you a little bit. In all these cases, the verb to give is at the end of the sentence. The subject is at the beginning of the sentence. And then there's the other stuff in between. 
In A and B, you have the third person for men and the single uh, third person for girl built into the verb as the first suffix. And in C, you have me built into the front part of the verb. And in D, you have you, because that's the person who you're giving the meat to, um, built into the verb. So these are really interesting things that we need to figure out a good way to treat, teach our learners so that they know this forward and back. Because that's the goal of language continuation is to, to make new learners. So. Um, the tribe hired a linguist, Dr. Tom Gavon, um, who's from Europe, to develop a writing system back in the late 60s. So we've had a writing system since then. Mm -hmm. did, an did that answer your question? Yeah, okay. So the challenge is, for me, why I went, came from linguistics coming into tribal politics was to find a way to protect our linguistic sovereignty in the face of ongoing colonization and systematic structural and um, internalized oppression. That's the big challenge, how do we do this? And these are some of the academy kids. And when I taught there, um, because you, language has a bunch of different parts in the words, I was, I was teaching them the sign language sign for each of the parts so they knew how to put the parts together. So they were always busy with their hands and that really helped from punching each other or pulling each other's hair, or picking nose and you know what kids do. <laughs> but it, it turned out to be a very powerful teaching tool for the kids because it kept them involved physically. So Hinton, who is an expert in revitalization says, you need to have persistence, not taking no for an answer, sustainability and honesty in order to have a successful program in language revitalization. So those are the main things. Not taking no for an answer is um, one thing that I'm really good at. <laughs> so I wanted to speak on to what is going on with our language now. Um, we have our academy and language, language is taught to all the students every day uh, and their kids um, not six weeks anymore, but seven months all the way up to sixth graders get Ute language lessons every day. But there are some issues. One is not all of our tribal students go to the academy. So it's only a select group of our students. The program isn't full immersion. Full immersion is the most successful way to produce speakers. Right now, the age of our speakers it's hard for them, if you're over 70, to want to come into a preschool classroom and wrangle preschoolers. <laughs> Plus the germs. You know, you kind of want to protect the elders from getting sick. Also, many people think that if you're a speaker, you should know how to teach. That's not true. We need to have specific training for our speakers, our second language learners who are going to go into the classroom, to learn how to teach effectively, to keep the kids active and make it fun. And for me, the hardest part is reversing attitudes. There's some speakers that think it's too late. There's some parents that think the deficit view, if you start teaching my kids you, they'll get behind in all their other subjects. There's some teachers in the program who have that same view. They don't see it as really helping their brains expand. And then some students at the academy, they're wonderful speakers there, but when they go home, they don't say anything. So it's instilling and pride and excitement and information to, to know the benefits of, of keeping our language going. So since we're not supposed to take no for an answer, um, we do have something for just the academy students, but what about everyone else? So I'm gonna talk about some um, no, no taking activities here. <laughs> not taking no activities. So the first um, one is, uh, we, we named it Ute 101, but it lasted forever, so kept getting higher and higher. And it was some adult tribal members who said, you know, we really want to learn our language, and we want to do it, and we would love for the tribe to help us out. So they contacted um, Dr. Tong Bavon, who's um, the guy over there in the corner in the back, 
He's the one who wrote the um, writing system, the grammars, the narratives. He's the leading expert, and he's, you know, he's from Europe. He's not native. Um, so there was three of us that started the class, and uh, we thought, oh, this is going to be easy if we get um, things going on. The tribe will support us because we wanted to get some assistance from the tribe if we if we could. So we. Um, know that the tribe always says language is important. We have 17 official resolutions that say that. But when we started this class, we thought we'd get approval right away. We didn't. But we had already made flyers and put them everywhere. And we still didn't have approval. And so we said, oh, what do we do? <laughs> and we decided to do it because we wanted to keep our word to our community that we were going to do this class. And since we weren't approved by the tribe, we decided that we would take our own money and pay our own speakers to teach us our language. So Dr. Gavon, the linguist, he said, I will volunteer to teach the class as long as you have a fluent speaker in there and you pay the fluent speaker. So we all rotated on paying our speaker $100 a class because we wanted to respect their expertise. So we started the first class, even though we didn't have uh, permission. So on the first night of class, the vice chairperson of one of the committees we were supposed to go to to get approval before we went to tribal council came to our class. She was pissed off, really pissed off. She said, you need to shut this class down. You have no right to have this class here because you don't have our approval or you don't have tribal council approval. Well, luckily for me, I was running late. <laughs> but my colleague took her money out of her pocket. She said, you see this money? If I want to pay a speaker to teach me my language, I'm going to do it because it's my money and it's my language. If you're here to help, you're welcome to stay. Otherwise, you're welcome to leave. So we were a renegade class. And man, when we were a renegade class, we were super popular. <laughs> we were super popular. Um, we've had like 89 different tribal members, community members come through. Why do you think the tribe didn't want to approve this, this class? Fear that they would lose control? Fear of the government? No. No. How many of them spoke yet? Not very many. Not very many at all. They, were they worried that the teacher was going to say it wrong? Yeah. Why would they worry that? Because he was white. How can we approve a white person teaching us our language? It doesn't matter if he is the leading expert and all our previous tribal council members employed him to work on the dictionary, to write our language, to write our narratives. He worked with 80 million of our uh, speakers before. He's the expert. They didn't see that in him. And he's a volunteer. They just saw his race. And they didn't see that he was doing it for free, just because he loves the language, because he wanted to pay back all those older speakers that helped him do his job. They didn't see any of that. So when we finally got uh, approval, guess what happened to our class? Cool. <laughs> Attendance went way down, because we weren't a renegade class anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but we went on for, for many, many years, and my mom, my late mom, turned out being a really good instructor for the class. And then she passed um, in 20, I can't, I can't really remember, because COVID was the blur, you know. So while I was uh, off from teaching, I decided to write a grant, um, an ANA grant to start a Ute Language Institute. That had been my dream since I've been an instructor at the American Indian Language Development Institute at the University of Arizona. 
I wanted to recreate that in the four corners because we have such a huge population of diverse tribes there. And I wanted to have it at Fort Lewis so that the students could get graduate or undergraduate credits for going to the institute. So I wrote the grant and it got funded. So we, they started the Southwest Indigenous Language Development Institute in um, 20. And it's a three-year grant. The first cohort of um, 37 uh, Ute tribal members will be graduating in the beginning of May at Fort Lewis. They're going to have a, a ceremony. They're trained in immersion teaching and linguistics, and they'll get a certificate from Fort Lewis. And the reason why I wanted this to happen is because I wanted us to train up our own teachers and second language learners so they can go out in their community. And we, I made it so that it wasn't just Southern Utes. It was Ute Mountain Utes and the Utah Utes. Why do you think I did that? Hmm? Cohesion. Cohesion. Because we're sister tribes. We were one nation before. Why should we exclude each other? We're sisters. So that's an exciting development. Um, so that was not taking no for an answer. You're not going to give us money? Let me write a grant and we'll go through Fort Lewis and we'll get this done. And then in 2021, when I was on tribal council, see I'm wearing the same outfit. <laughs> We made a list of priorities, and Ute language was one of them. But every time any proposal comes in to support Ute language, what happens? Do we put our money where our mouth is? I vote for it, but I'm the only one, and there's seven of us. It's so frustrating. So we started another community youth class. And this class is different because it does not meet on tribal property. It's on our local public library. It's free. We have the same volunteers, our a contingent of volunteers, that we pay our speakers out of our own pocket. Um, we meet twice a week for a total of four hours a week. And the goal is to just keep our language going. Because if our tribe isn't going to offer something for our adults, we'll do it ourselves. So we do it ourselves. Um, it's another sort of renegade class. Um, our speaker there, Dorothy Wing, she was so excited about what we're doing in class, she decided that we were going to do a play all in Ute. She composed the, 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 some songs for it, a prayer for it. We did all the props. And we were going to do this play at our tribal Christmas program where all our tribal members and our sister tribes come for a big dinner. So we contacted the department in charge. What do you think they told us? No. Why do you think not? Yes, because it's a group that's not affiliated with the tribe. <laughs> Damned if we do, damned if we don't. So being who I am, I was like, we're going to go up there, and I'm going to get the mic, and we're going to do the play. I don't care who's going to try to stop us. I'm going to get some big guys. They're going to hold off the other guys while we do our play real quick. I was ready. But my speaker said, this is bigger. What we're doing is bigger than this play. Let that go and let's just keep our momentum going forward. I was like, bah, 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 bah. <laughs> So this is sort of kind of how we are trying to keep our language going. And some of the things we learned, learned about linguistic purism is in our families, because we're fiercely familiar because of our um, familial, because of our um, bands, our band and our family is right and everyone else is wrong. And so they're like battling, you're saying it wrong. You And also from speakers to non-speakers, you're not, there's no way you can learn you. It's just too hard. It's too late. Just let it die. Or like my mom said, you know, the kids, they know all the right words and they're all in the right places, but they don't sound Ute. 
And to me, that was a challenge to figure out what I needed to teach differently so our learners did sound mute. And then we also had from the linguists to the fluent speakers, the, the speakers now are different from the speakers he had worked with in the 70s. And so he, he kind of shamed them, like, you don't talk like the old ones did. But this is all we have, language changes, Langu language evolves. So these were some of the interesting um, conflicts we came upon. And then, you know, after I gave this talk, um, the last time people were asking me, why do you think there's pushback from the tribal government? And I think for me, learning about this concept of death by despair, like when jobs leave com communities, the hope leaves. So it turns into a hopeless situation where right now we're having a terrible issue with um, fentanyl, meth, and op opioids. So we're having a lot of people die of overdose. And we have 15% of our population, our tribal membership, that doesn't have access to clean water in their house. They have to haul it every day. And I think a lot has to do with internalized structural violence that we've been exposed to. And we're um, internalizing it in a way. Racism, like the instructor was not you, so we can't support the program. Uh, and social injustice that we're doing towards each other. But I, I really like us to focus on our language is dying and we just need to create speakers. And I think that's the end. And these are just some quick points about immersion if you're interested in immersion. It's a really effective way to keep languages alive. Um, so I told my older brother when my mom died, she left um, five acres. Uh, I said, we should just build an immersion preschool, take all the babies there, just teach them you on our own allotment. That's our own land. So we might have a fundraiser. <laughs> okay, any questions? I think for me that would be really awesome and that's something I talked to our education director about but she felt like the uh, market was already saturated with San Juan College, um, the Diné out, um, what are those called? Like their little centers that they have off campus and then Fort Lewis she thought it was in Pima Community College she thought the market was saturated but I think it would be a great idea to instill that educational sovereignty and have control over our education in our post-secondary. I think that'd be awesome. Yeah. So, um, I'm actually from California, and so I think part in language validation, I'm learning my tribal language. I've my class for you, so. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so I'm learning my tribal language, and I'm learning how to use that language Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of us who travel all over. Mm -hmm. So he is very big on it should all be oral learning, mm -hmm. which drives me insane because I uh -huh. find that way very well. Uh -huh. So we felt so like he'll start writing down the words for us because we only have the class once a week. But I just want to know like what you think about that struggle. Of, I think it's different because um, there is few reservations and you can't do a lot more like class in person. But what do you think about like oral learning versus giving those language resources so like families can? 
Yeah, I am 100% into the um, oral learning. I think if you're taught right, if you have visuals and you have motions and it's comprehensible input with tons and tons of repetition, it sinks in your brain. Um, when I taught at Aldi, I did immersion lessons uh, for 20 minutes twice a day. And by the end of four weeks, they knew so much you. Um, and it was all visual. But I, I know, and, and, and audit, oral, but I know that a lot of adults think they can't learn. And when they have that in their mind, it makes it hard to learn. So I think that if it were me, if I were your teacher, I would do it orally with visuals and keep you active. And at the end, as a compromise, I would send a list of the words home. Yeah, but yeah, and if you do it visual and orally, it sticks in your brain, especially if you use some sort of sign language. It just seeps in. You know, at Aldi, people come, my students are like, I was dreaming of you. <laughs> I was like, is that a bad thing? <laughs> I want to dream in my language, not you. And I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> but immersion does work. But you have to be trained and very patient with your students. If you just tell a person once or twice, they're not going to learn it. You know, and you have to repeat it a lot, a lot of times in very interesting ways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep it up. Yeah. And if you want to give your instructor my email, that's fine. <laughs> Any other questions? Why is there a vote back from the tribal council to include um, this from the southern tribe in Ignacio? And I would call and I would ask, what type of programs are there for my culture and my language? And they would say that there are stuff, you just got to go to them. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that right now there's not a very strategic plan for how we keep our culture and language alive. And I think if we had that cohesive plan that everyone was following and we had the same information in all different the departments that do language and culture, it would make it a much more comprehensive program. Right now, it's just like here and here and here. And the culture department, since our program isn't part of the tribe, they don't feel like they need to tell people about it. You know, and so maybe we need to do a better job on advertising what we have to offer as our renegade classes. Yeah. But you have my email, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's one of my side projects with Tribal Council is to get like women's bathrooms and all that labeled in youth. So I want to get that done before my term ends. Yeah, because I did get support on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, with the Cornish thing, like having that language and cult, like, like one of the big things about Pride and Pride and Cornish language is it's completely wiped out by the bridge. Mm -hmm. So it's like putting that up is not only saying this is our language, but also uh, we are not British, we are Cornish. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Just Sense of identity and sovereignty. Yep. Badassery, sorry. <laughs> you mentioned several times throughout the presentation about the, the deficit here. Yeah. Being a, a big issue that you're dealing with. Could you kind of flesh that out just a little bit? So so the deficit view is more like a racist view of indigenous people, you know. Um, we, as a government, have to take care of this land because we know these savages can't ha manage them on their own. So we'll have to baby them and we'll have to... Like right now, we are working on revising our tribal codes and ordinances, but we have to get BIA approval. And we've been waiting like three years and they haven't done anything. And so it's a very patriarchal system where we're looked down as like incompetent, like deficit, like there's something wrong with us that we can't run our own governments on our own. 
And so I would like to see our constitution change where we don't need BIA's approval on those things anymore because that really emancipates us from them. And, and so the deficit view is really the racist view like, oh, these poor brown people, they can't handle it on their own. And I think we have that um, sort of built in because of all the brainwashing that goes on in American society, you know, sad to say. But that's one thing we really need to fight against. I just I thought about that sometime a few weeks ago, why they still call the Bureau of Indian Affairs instead of Lady just for the historical values. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not even the right name for us. Yeah. <laughs> Speaks into that. So I think, you know, a lot of that has to go back with our own work that we have to do as individuals and tribal communities to learn to get out from under that deficit view uh, and then Walk, uh, move into our own sovereignty and continue to fight for what we need to just be renegades. Mm -hmm. And part of that, we're publishing our online, our codes online, even though BIA hasn't approved them yet, but we're doing it anyway. <laughs> Don't yeah. say that. <laughs> keep hope, keep hope. Um, so for us, another part of the reason why they didn't want to approve our first renegade class is because we wanted it open to all community members. They wanted it just to Southern Ute tribal members. And our reservation is so checkerboard that we have spouses who aren't Ute. If a mom is raising a Ute child, they should be able to come to the class and learn Ute so they can teach the Ute kids Ute. If we have non-native people working with our elders as employees and they want to come and learn Ute so they can speak Ute to the elders they work with, what's the problem? The more the merrier. The more the merrier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I grew up about 15 minutes from the Fort Duchesne uh, Reservation in Utah. And our K through 12, there wasn't, it was not culturally responsive at all. Um, so what would you say is the role and responsibility of education and higher education institutions to uh, protect, affirm, and provide space for cultural practices which Fort Lewis does a really good job of doing? What would you say for those other educators? I think it's, it's all our responsibility, but um, like in Colorado, we have, uh, it's required to teach Colorado history in fourth grade, and there's a component of that with Ute history, and so we developed a whole curriculum, it's called uh, New Chu Strong, it's online on the um, Colorado Department of Education, and so we developed that for all fourth grade students to learn about Ute history, but it's optional. Some people saying it's optional. So now we're working to make sure that it's not optional anymore. Yeah, and so we have to hold space all the time. And I was just talking to some of the professors about it would be nice to have a scholarship here for a couple of Ute students who want to come here to support that, especially considering that some of our children died here at the Teller Institute, and this is our homeland. Yeah, but we all got to hold space. Oh, the trees? Yeah, that's, that's a, a way of doing language analysis using um, linguistics. That's syntax, with you have those trees. Yeah, and, and for native students, we're very visual. I know. <laughs> it's very helpful to have a lot of visuals with the learning. Yeah, so I imagine we could do some trees in your language. That would be fun. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> Mr. Anderson Montgomery could help you here in person. He's a linguist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
fun legislators about like you know trying to keep ICWA and, and what's going on with Arizona right now. Mm -hmm. I think for, for us right now, um, money, support, donations, anything like that, uh, always asking when anything is going on is, have you consulted natives about this issue that might affect them, especially with legislator legislation. We have so much legislation that gets passed that affects us, and after it's passed, they're like, oh, we didn't think about you guys. Yeah, and so, all that stuff, all that good stuff, and, and learning yourself and teaching those around you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No? The use here would have been the northern, that were in the Grand Junction area, would have been northern. Well, we, we all cycled through different areas, different bands. Oh, yeah, sure. mm hmm yeah. We good? Well, to which thank you very much.